So I don't know still having now decided to take this for a second drive tonight. I don't know still whether it's a Ferrari or a Ford. I don't know. I'm still careful how I handle it. Uh, it, it, it it's, if it's a Ford, it's not bad. More people need Fords than Ferraris. But we should all have one or two Ferraris in our conceptual garage. Something that's a bit rare. Something that is a head turner. Something that takes your attention. Something you like to show people in a way you wouldn't if it was just a Ford that they, they've seen before. And we that are committed to doing this well, to saying things well, we that feel that a huge part of our calling is to say a thing well, um, are very interested in things that could possibly be Ferraris in the life of the church. So I don't know. We'll see. You'll be the judge. I'm going to speak to you about Samson. Everybody say Samson. Samson. We've misunderstood Samson terribly. And as a result of misunderstanding him, I think by and large we have been unkind and ungracious to Samson. There are many young people here tonight and I don't know how long you've been around church. The possibility is that you have not been in church long enough to have heard a message about Samson because he is not often spoken about. Therefore, I am so glad if you are a blank piece of paper regarding Samson. I'm glad that I may tonight be the first person to ever speak to you about Samson so that what you go on from here to hear about him, at least you have something in your mind to balance out the overwhelming negativity about him that you will hear whenever you hear his name mentioned. I think we have been unkind to him. We've been unkind to a number of individuals in Scripture. For instance, Martha Mary's sister. Fancy being known all of your life and forever after in church history as the one that didn't choose the best part. The one that Jesus kind of rebuked. Imagine being the person that's known throughout history as the one that had to be corrected because you're stressful and Mary chose the more worshipful part and that's Martha's kind of memory and legacy. We have been so unkind to Martha because we have adored and sought to emulate Mary and Mary's part sitting at Christ's feet worshipping him but guess, guess where Mary did that she did it in a home that belonged to Martha it wasn't Mary's house it was actually Martha's house no one mentions that and we get so excited and we get so doughy eyed about the oil she put on Jesus' feet. What about the oil that was cooking stuff in the kitchen? That was producing hospitality? That was serving Jesus great food? Is one oil more significant than the other? I have been to all Mary and no Martha churches. They're the ones that forget to pick you up at the airport. Because they're so away with the fairies. I've been, to the, I've been to the old Martha, no Mary churches. They're the ones where it's hard to spot Jesus in it all. Because they're so organized and professional and corporate. And these two girls were sisters. And they were not the ugly sisters. And these two sisters together built and ran that house. And we need these two sisters also in the church in great balance. I think we've been unkind to Martha. I think we've been unkind to Thomas. Imagine being known as Doubting Thomas. You know, the Bible didn't call him that. That's not a Bible idea. We have called him that. Jesus never called him Doubting Thomas. Come here, Doubting Thomas. And if you look at Thomas's life afresh, you will see that he brought something to the team no one else did. He's the one when Jesus said, we're going to go and raise Lazarus. And the disciples were terrified at the prospect of going to try and intercept, interrupt, get involved in somebody that's already dead. 
it was Thomas that said, let's just go. We'll all, we'll all come and die with you, Jesus. If it's going to be that bad, I'm up for it. We don't look at that part of him. You do know, don't you, that Jesus intentionally chose a man to be in his core team who had a propensity to doubt. He said, I want a doubter on the team. Somebody you wouldn't have on your team. He intentionally positioned him, I think, to educate us about how much doubt is a part of our journey and how important it is to not be threatened by doubt, but to see great value in doubt and to see the disadvantages of doubt, but never to stereotype people into being automatically losers because of their propensity to doubt. I think we've been unkind to Jonah. I think we've demonized Jonah and only taken, taken failure from his life. But I think we've misunderstood Jonah. I think we've been unkind even to Judas. And to John Mark. I could go on. All of these names that I am mentioning to you tonight were all called, chosen, loved and used by God. All of them had their part to play. In the massive global plan of God, they had a moment on stage. On, wow. They had lines to say. They had things to do. Yeah. Some of their parts on the stage of history were unpleasant and difficult for any human being to walk that path. But all of them had a path to walk, including Judas. And I have a whole alternative take on him too, but we'll get to him another time. Samson was one of what I call God's beautiful contradictions. If you, if you didn't think God has them, I'm looking at a lot here tonight. <laughs> People that are filled with apparent contraflows, mixture, great, not so great, yay, oh, not so much yay, in the same life. The title for this idea about Samson's life tonight, which sums up what I want to help you see about him, that I've never heard anyone ever, ever speak about Samson in the way I will to you tonight. Is Samson God's magnificent irritation? There's my graphic. It is very graphic, isn't it? That's the jawbone with which he killed a thousand of the best of the Philistine Navy SEALs with that thing he found on the ground. This hardly even comes close to the carnage that must have been there that day because this guy, Samson, could rip lions limb from limb. What could he do to a human being if he decided to rip them limb from limb. So the carnage was probably far worse than anything that indicates. But what I'm after is calling your attention to this idea I have about him, that he was God's magnificent irritation. Every message I've ever heard about Samson is negative, tragic, shame, failure, immoral, Weak. If you Google Samson, I promise you, nothing good comes up. I have Googled him and nothing good comes up. But one of the first things that comes up is an article written by a preacher called Samson's Silver Spoon. It's about the fact that he was born with everything going for him and he threw it all away. This is the lesson of his life, that he was stupid, he was weak, and he threw everything away that you would only dream has been a possible beginning for your life. When I googled him and nothing good came up, it reinforced my commitment to, around the world for a season, speak about him, celebrate him, and I realized that I think differently about him. Because I realized that part of my gift and calling is that I am drawn to underdogs. 
I am fascinated by write-offs. I'm interested in losers and failures. Because all the overdogs, if there is such a term, by their hundreds left our church in the late 90s. When I transitioned our church from being too comfortable, too inward looking, too white, too middle class, outwards to reaching our city. And within a year of me deciding to do that, I was busing in 500 people a week from the worst, you call them projects, from the worst council estates in our city and some of the top three worst in our country. I bust in 500 scoundrels a week. That's what they were. 500 Samsons a week. And all the people that were the leaders and the elders and the givers and the leaders and the mature people, we really needed to stay left because they couldn't stomach the idea of coming and sitting next to certain types of people. I think ever since then, and clearly before then, when I think back, I've had this heart, this fascination, because those, our church halved in two years. We went from just over 600 to less than 300 in about two years. And I replaced them numerically, but you can't replace them in maturity or in established habits of Christianity that are essential to building a great church. And I knew that these 500 scoundrels a week were my opportunity to experiment. They became my guinea pigs in my church laboratory. And I thought this, if I can grow these people, if I can grow these scoundrels, if I can make leaders out of them, if I can turn them to be useful, then if I can grow these people, I can grow anybody in the world. And for the next 15 years, I settled down to looking at underdogs differently, realizing that hundreds of them and thousands since them are worthy of more investigation. Because we have filed so many people under a weakness or a failure and walked away, not realizing that amongst them is a massive lost resource to the church, to the planet, because we have been too lazy to look closer and we have bought into what others say about them. I'm glad God never did that about me or you. This is so out of control now in my life that when a pastor asked me a question recently in a pastor's conference in Australia, he said, can I ask you, he said, what is your counsel after 30 odd years of pastoring? What is your counsel about how to handle loose cannons in the church? I assume by his question, he had people in the church that he felt were a threat to the stability of the church. And he wondered how over the years, especially hearing me talk about what I just said about the scoundrels, amongst which were many loose cannons, that would be a compliment to them. That would be a good day. That would be, that would be a good scoundrel. He said, what do you feel about loose cannons in the church? And I didn't hesitate and said to him, if I were you, I'd be looking amongst them for my leaders. It's the last thing in the world he expected to hear or anyone else. I think they all wanted a refund on the conference delegate fee for me coming out with such nonsense. And I said, don't you think Jesus all of his life was viewed as a loose cannon? Depends who's asking, depends who's looking. And I could go through and name these retrospective heroes. They weren't heroes on the day they arrived and the day they stood up and went against the status quo. They weren't heroes on the day they picked up a whip of cords and kicked over tables. There was nobody saying we should make him our leader then. And I realized that the reason I'm drawn and fascinated by Samson and seeing something of value in him and taking time to look at him differently is very much to do with how 
I am wired. Am I learning to give myself much more to that as I age and as I try to do better as a communicator to ask you with me to sit and listen and think differently about someone that if you've been in church any length of time, you will only ever have heard negative about. Wow. Here's, here's how we need to empathize. I think that's a fair word. Here's how I think we need to empathize. Put ourselves in the shoes of Samson and then ask yourself, how would that affect me? Because Samson, unlike every one of us in this room, was never called by God. He was born a leader with no option. He had never had the chance to say yes or no, like all of us have. From before he was born, his destiny, his fate, his life was scripted. He had no option. He had no choice. Samson never volunteered. He had nothing to volunteer to. The volunteer option was removed from his life from before he was born. He is only one of three in the whole of history whose birth was announced by an angel. The other two, as you all know, I know you don't all know, but I'm being kind to you, was Isaac and Jesus. But he's the only one of the three to whose parents the angel appeared twice. Not once, twice. He had a very godly but barren mother who couldn't conceive. And it seems to me quite a dim, unspiritual father. Because the angel appeared to his mother, knowing the father was not there, and told the mother of the child she was going to have, when she saw her husband later and told him about the angelic visitation, which we think theologically, this visitation, by the way, was perhaps Christ in one of his pre-incarnate appearances. Just don't even bother with that if you don't know what I just said. Don't don't bother. (laughs) Nobody really cares. But it's fascinating to me as a student of angelic appearances that you don't get more senior appearance than this one. And the husband said, whoa, what, what? Get the angel to come back if you can and say it all again with me there. So she asked God to send the angel again and the angel came again and still excluded the husband. When he appeared a second time, he appeared just to her. And she had to beg him to hang around while she went and fetched her husband. So she brings her husband and the angel repeats the basis of what's going to happen. The husband was so disoriented so flummoxed, so panicky. He said, well, uh, let me, uh, tell me your name. (laughs) And the angel said, my name is too magnificent to say it. If I said it, you would not be able to stay on your feet. My name is too phenomenal to utter to a human being. So I can't, do that. So Samson's father to be said, well, let me at least make you something to eat. His wife must have been so embarrassed. Excuse my husband. I'm so sorry. Now I understand why you, why you excluded him. And so he makes a little meal and lights a fire to cook the meal. And the Bible tells us the angel disappeared in the flame, ascended to heaven in the flames. When her husband saw that, he looked at his wife and said, we're going to die. God is going to kill us. And she said to him, what in the world are you talking about? Why would God come to us twice, tell us what's going to happen, and then kill us? Hello? Was I guess how that conversation went 
So he has this beautiful godly mum and a very dull spiritual dad <laughs> in his so parenting. These are all factors that yeah. it's worth talking about yeah. as we try to get in Samson's shoes a little bit. He was a Nazarite from conception. Not only was he to be raised under Nazarite prohibitive laws and rules, his own mother had to live as a Nazarite while she was carrying him. This is never heard of anywhere else in scripture. Every other Nazarite was called to be that somewhere in their lifetime. Samson was chosen to be a Nazarite before he had a choice. And his mother had to be, behave like and live like a Nazarite while she carried him. He was born into 40 years, four decades of Philistine rule and Philistine oppression and government over Israel. But here's the interesting thing again to be in Samson's shoes. There is no record in that four decades ever of the Israelites calling out to God for help from Philistine oppression, suggesting to me that they had become comfortable with living under the rule of the Philistines. I think the contemporary term for it is the Stockholm Syndrome. When people that are kidnapped form a codependent relationship with their kidnappers and almost adopt it as a new life for them rather than trying to escape or preserve their identity. I wonder if after 40 years of no one crying out to God, they had become comfortable under this ungodly Philistine rule because at least they didn't have to make decisions every day for themselves because when someone else calls the shots governmentally, it makes your life easier. I think, I think the more fringy, borderline Jews enjoyed the mixture that they were able to have by being in a Philistine country because they had maybe more options to be less dedicated, less committed because of the dilution effect of the Philistine rule over the Israelites gave them different options for their expression of worship. Perhaps many of them enjoyed that part of it too. 40, 40 years of Philistine rule. Samson born with no option but to from birth be raised as a Nazarite as a leader, according to what the angel came and told his parents twice. Now, you all okay? Yes. All right, we're going to try and land this baby in 10 minutes. Here's, here's what I've never, ever heard any preacher speak about. And it breaks my heart because I don't think you can read this and then skim over to him and Delilah. He's forever linked with Delilah. Yeah. Are, you, are you kidding me? Are you telling me that what I just told you? Wow. Are you telling me that, that the takeaway from this man's life is him and Delilah? Are you kidding me? Are you telling me that that's the takeaway from his life? This, this, amazing, this amazing individual, the amazing supernatural unprecedented way in which he arrived in the world. Are you telling me that we are to reduce his life? To that thing with Delilah, are you kidding me? Is what I think when I read this. I think this guy is amazing. And, and here's, here's, my, here's my insight to this title here. And my angle on this. Judges 14, 1 to 4. Samson went down to Timnah and saw a young Philistine woman. When he returned, he said to his father and mother, I have seen a Philistine woman in Timnah. Now get her for me as my wife. His parents replied, Isn't there an acceptable woman 
among your own people, must you go to the uncircumcised Philistines to get a wife? But Samson said to his father, get her for me. She's the right one for me. Now watch this. His parents did not know that this was from the Lord. Watch this even carefuller. Who was seeking an occasion to confront the Philistines. For at that time, they were ruling over Israel. Let me, let me rephrase this for you. After 40 years of Philistine rule and nobody having a problem with it, the only way for God to interrupt, the only way for God to break this endless cycle of mediocrity and average and settling down under way, way less than God's best, the only way for God to do anything about this was to send someone through whom to send someone who is whose calling and commissioning of their life was one simple reason God sent Samson to be his let me have my screensaver back up God sent Samson to be his magnificent irritation in the skin of the Philistines. In other words, listen carefully, God wanted for decades, God wanted to pick a fight with the Philistines. And somewhere in the council of heaven, they had an idea. Let's, let's send a man and through his life, we will intentionally pick a fight with the Philistines. And the fight he picks will be such an irritant in the lives of the Philistines that my people will never ever go back under that rule again. And here's, what else, here's what else the preachers don't tell us. For 20 years, two decades, Samson was God's divine irritation under the skin of the Philistines. And Israel never ever went back after this 20 years of his judge ruling. 20 years. He was a leader for 20 years. And for 20 years, he irritated the hell out of those Philistines. He did. And here's why this matters. And here's why we don't talk about it. Because we have no theology for a trouble causing God. We have no framework for divine irritation. We have no belief system for God inspired violence. We have no belief system, no theology for God inspired unreasonableness, stubbornness. Non negotiables, defiance. And listen to me. If you have never, and I don't know if any of us have, I think I think I have experienced this in the crossing over of our church that I mentioned earlier in, in the church many of the church leaving and me being left with ground zero and these people I mean we were in financial free fall. All the money went out the door as people took their tithes. They're building pledges with them. We were committed to a 2,000-seater auditorium. All the money went out the door, as well as all the gift and all the ability. In two years, it was just a nightmare for two years. I think somewhere in that two years, if you have never been hijacked by God, that's what Samson had. Let's, be, let's call it what it is. From birth, he is hijacked by an agenda he has no control over and no voice into. If you've never been set up by God, if you've never been used by God, if you've never been a victim of divinity, 
you will never understand Samson. You will judge him. You will, you will be lazy and go with the stereotypical opinions of him. This tonight is about asking you to maybe disengage autopilot about him and maybe think of him differently. And as I said earlier, if this is the first time you have spent any time about Samson, I'm glad that this is your thinking on him. You'll get others as you stick around church. I ask you to remember this one. Because if you've never been hijacked by God, and I in those two or three years of losing people, I was so drunk with the possibility of a better future for our church that I spent two years day in, day out fighting the church mafia. And they're a scary bunch. And I woke up every single day and I kind of put boxing gloves on as I went to sit with yet another couple that came to tell me how much they hated my guts before they left the church and took others with them. And for two years, I slept like a baby to the point where I got concerned that I wasn't more upset. And I didn't have a language for it then. I had no language for it. I think this is something to do with, I was hijacked by God for two years to pick a fight with people in the church who had no intention of letting us reach people in our city that they would not even think about coming sitting next to. I think, I think for two years I was God's irritation to, to the Philistines, as it were. The Apostle Paul talks about himself being compelled. This is a little bit what I'm talking about. This, this internal compulsion to the point where when prophets say to him, whoever this belt belongs to that I'm tying your hands with now, Agabus the prophet took Paul's own belt and tied his hands and stood back and said to him, God says whoever Whoever this belt belongs to, knowing it was his. And what I'm doing with it is that this is what will happen to the person who owns this belt if he continues his drive to want to go to Rome and stepped back. And Paul looked him in the eye and said, I'm not just willing to go to Rome and lose my freedom. I'm willing to go to Rome and die. So thanks a lot. I don't see that as God telling me not to go. I see that as God giving me a heads up. If you do, it's going to be rough. Wow. And because Paul is so compelled with something no one could understand, he went to Rome and lost his life in Rome and died before his time, we might all think, as by the way we might think Samson did. Who died so tragically, preachers tell me. Died so tragically with his eyes gouged out. But then his hair began to grow again. And we don't know how old he was when he was died. Maybe he was in his 40s. And the Bible tells us he took more with him. Yes. When he died, he killed more Philistines. As if it was one final, I'm so going to irritate you suckers even more. And hey, when you, have, when you have finished being God's divine irritation... You might as well go. Because when you're called to be in irritation, you're probably not good in peacetime. You're just not. I've had to learn that. I still am because I'm still up for a fight all the time with, with the church status quo. I hate religion. And God knows that's killed the church in Europe for generations. So I look at the other company, and Moses, that chose hardship. In, 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 in Hebrews 11 it says yeah. when he was grown yeah. he chose to be mistreated yeah. with the people yeah. he considered disgrace which he knew would come he considered disgrace worthwhile going through yes. for the sake of being a leader 
to break 450 years of slavery and bondage of God's people. He chose to step away from royal privilege and suffer. Moses was intentional about pain. And said, I choose that pain. Who does that? Who would do that? And all of his life was just a catalog of agony for that man's soul. And then of course Jesus who set his face as a flint. So I pray, I've got to close. I pray for the restoration of divine irritation in our churches. Because I am irritated by our irrelevance. Certainly in Europe. I'm irritated by our small mindedness and our territorialness. I'm irritated by our insecurities and our crybaby attitudes. I'm irritated by our entitlement mentalities. I'm irritated by celebrity pastor culture. I'm irritated by our narcissism in the church. I'm irritated by our obsession to grow the church instead of growing people. And if salt and light are anything, they're irritants. We don't think of them as that. But what happened to salt is, put this in your eye. What happened to irritation of light shone with such brilliance and such clarity that it becomes an irritant rather than just an illuminator. Come on, let's stand together. The time's gone. Father, we are humbled and we are thoughtful tonight about our brother, Samson. And we apologize for being unkind to him. Would you pass that on to him for us? Where we have been unkind to him. Would you, would you give him this audio that perhaps he might know that somewhere in the earth we are seeing him in a different light that we are seeing him as your beautiful irritation in order to get some change in a generational settling in your people I pray for the re-emergence I pray for the growth of this spirit in our young people I pray the young people will will understand what it is to be an irritant in society, in education, in business as usual, churches. I pray that they will shrug and and step away from religion and safety and mediocrity. That they will not settle for anything less than the best that you have for their lives. I pray that we will look twice and look three or four times at those that we have written off as seeing no value in. I pray there will be an outbreak, as it were, of us looking in different places for leadership in our future. From where we've perhaps looked and assumed it would come from in the years gone by. God, we thank you for this massive master plan you have. That if it was our choice, would have far few people involved in it than by your grace are involved. Thank you for including us. Thank you for including us because we know we are your beautiful contradictions, many of us. Help us to have greater grace and empathy for that in each other. And help us to celebrate afresh Samson's life in a way perhaps that we're well overdue from doing in your church around the world. Raise up Samson's. Who prays that? What leaders are praying that around the world? Raise up Samson's. There's nobody praying that. But in light of how we're seeing him tonight, we pray that in these places around the world where your church has settled, for mediocrity, and for business as usual, 
We pray for the emergence of a divine irritant that will be a game changer in these nations and continents around the world where your church has gone to sleep and just accept whatever the generations before them did. Thank you for using my life to be an irritant in the late 90s to change things, to break something free and loose in and through our church to the many, many thousands that didn't even know we existed prior to that time. Thank you, Jesus.